thank you very much. And good evening, everybody. That was The Junk Man Rag by Lucky Roberts. I'll tell you more about him and uh, all the music I'm going to do tonight. I decided that tonight would be um, a repeat of one of the themes that I did last year, which uh, I used the title. I borrowed it from an old Max Marath album, Max Marath in Jazz Country. So tonight is Adam in Jazz Country. <sighs> Looks like we're doing pretty well. Uh, let me know if there's uh, any audio or visual issues on both YouTube and Facebook. And if you know anybody that likes this kind of music, please share the, the live stream feed. I'd appreciate that very much. And I like to do... Uh, concerts like this once in a while, music of this nature, just to kind of prove that uh, my expertise extends beyond just ragtime piano. And since I did a strictly ragtime piano instrumental concert last week, I figured I'd delve into the classic early jazz this weekend. And so if you have requests in that line, send those in too. Uh, the reason I opened with that Lucky Roberts piece is that he was sort of a transitional figure between ragtime and what became known as stride piano. In fact, he's probably my favorite of, of that genre of musician. He was one of the first uh, of the black Harlem pianists to have his music published, Junk Man Rag and Pork and Beans. And, uh, but let's talk now about the man who became known as the father of stride piano. He's the grandfather of all jazz piano, and that's James P. Johnson. And uh, he wrote the song that was the anthem of the Roaring Twenties, the Charleston, and a lot of other great stuff. I, uh, I thought I might play, <laughs> even though that first one was uh, quite a quite rip snorting. I thought I'd play James P. Johnson's Carolina Shout. And this is kind of the maple leaf rag of stride piano. It's, it's the classic of all stride piano pieces. The Carolina Shout by James P. Johnson.
Thank you so much, everybody. That's Carolina Shout by James P. Johnson. It's the classic of all stride piano, which uh, he first recorded on a piano roll, I believe. It goes all the way back to the year 1917. And James P. Johnson, uh, the style of playing that he played, in the early days, it is really what you might have called ragtime. He did write pieces with the word rag in the title. And... But pretty quickly, he, he became the greatest of all the New York City jazz pianists. Other people like U.B. Blake idolized him. And y you can hear why in his records and piano rolls. And uh, the term stride comes from how far the left hand strides over the base of the piano. Uh, but uh, I, I consider it very much a form of jazz rather than a later form of ragtime because it's so much more improvisatory. Im improvisation being uh, a major part of jazz music in general. And um, you could hear in that Carolina Shout, for instance, a little bit of call and response patterns, which he picked up from black churches and, and other early jazz musicians and so forth. Uh, those are some of the prime tenets of that style of playing. And uh, I'm not the best in the world at it, but I, I love to, to give it a go. And uh, I have idolized James P. Johnson and his student, Fats Waller, for many years. In fact, Fats Waller probably became even better known than his, his former teacher. So, um, let's see. Let me go ahead and play a couple more songs here before I try and take any requests. I'd like to uh, do two of... Uh, all the people that knew him seemed to call him Jimmy Johnson. It was never as formal as James P. So... Uh, Here's two of Jimmy Johnson's most famous songs, both of which were introduced in a 1923 black Broadway show called Runnin' Wild. And uh, the songs are Old Fashioned Love and The Charleston, the crazy dance number of the 20s. And uh, my arrangement of The Charleston is mostly based on the composer's own hand-played piano roll. I'm kind of proud of my arrangement of that because I took the composer's piano roll and then added one more chorus on the end of it, as played by the great novelty pianist Roy Bargy. Uh, so now I put the two tunes together since they're from the same show. Old Fashioned Love and the Charleston. <laughs> Thank you. 
Charleston, everybody. Thank you very much. At least a virtual bow will have to do. <laughs> uh, well, we already got 75 people watching here on Facebook. That's terrific. And we've got 60 on YouTube. I'm very glad that the numbers, yeah, they're not growing a whole lot, but they also don't seem to be dissipating. So, you know, I intend to keep doing these broadcasts uh, as long as there's still interest in them. You know, I, I still have no public, no major public in engagements um, or festivals or anything booked until at least next fall. Maybe one in the Philadelphia area, maybe a festival in Sacramento. Uh, those big events still may be canceled, and so I'm relying on these concerts for income. And uh, speaking of which, I haven't mentioned, I, I think, yet that I do do these for virtual tips. And if you can leave tips on PayPal or Venmo, I sure appreciate it. The information is in the video postings. And um, I also have a P.O. box for people who don't want to use those. Amy says, this is so much fun. Thank you for doing these. Oh, well, I hope so, Amy. Thank you so much. Yeah, that's, that's the idea, and I, you know, not only do I miss doing real concerts, but I love getting to do one here at home on my good piano steadily every week because it allows me a chance to share so much of this music that uh, I often don't get to play for the public, uh, music that I love, and um, I'm so glad that uh, you're enjoying it. Incidentally, if you have requests, please go ahead and start sending them in. I'm not going to, to uh, try and stop you. <laughs> Just go for it. <laughs> um, I, I, I tend to read the comments on Facebook more so than on the YouTube page, on the YouTube chat. It's just a little hard to read both websites at the same time and play the piano. Uh, I don't see anything yet, so uh, I'm going to play a difficult James P. Johnson piano solo for you now. And I learned this at some point last year. It might have been when I did the initial jazz-themed broadcast. And I believe he wrote this in about 1929. And he recorded it with his, uh, with his jazz band and as a piano solo. And I've always loved this piece. It's a bit of a, a challenge. Uh, it's called You've Got to Be Modernistic. So let me give that a try. Of course, this is modernistic in 1929 terms. Remember, everything's relative.
to be modernistic. Don't forget to be futuristic and to be realistic. Modernistic, that's all. That's how the words go. There's only a couple of words, I think, that were ever written for the chorus of it. Well, I sure appreciate the nice comments, everybody. I saw a couple of requests go by. Um, I might be able to do one or two of them. Let's see. Oh, um, Jerry Lanish, you asked for something called Mississippi. I, I don't know what you mean. Uh, Mississippi mud. And in any case, the theme tonight is early jazz. So I'm going to try and stick to requests in that line. Um, I don't, I was discussing this with one of the viewers a few days ago. She said, why, you know, you don't always have to do a theme. And no, I know I don't at all, but I, I just enjoy it because it's a little more challenging and interesting for myself, you know. Uh, that does make it hard to get to requests sometimes. And of course, the point of the show is for, for all of you to enjoy it. I see a request for Sugarfoot Stomp. I love that piece, but unfortunately, I've never played it. Well, uh, my friend Dave Goodluckson is asking for uh, some Fats Waller, and I'd certainly planned on doing some of that tonight. I'm going to sit right down and write myself a letter. Yeah, that was a big hit that he had on record. He didn't compose it. I, I might play that for you. Why don't I? Let's, let's do it. Actually, I'll make a medley out of it. Um, oh, Mississippi Mud. Yeah, I might do that. Sure. Uh, let's see. Yeah, look, we'll do a little medley of uh, two of Fats Waller's big hits. Uh, I've got a feeling I'm falling, and then uh, we'll follow that up with one of his big hits that he recorded in the mid-30s. I'm going to sit right down and write myself a letter. Thank you. 
very much, everybody. A couple of Fats Waller hits. And uh, thanks for the nice words there, Alex, by the way. I, I appreciate that very, very much. Uh, while I'm on the subject of Fats Waller, let me perform for you my arrangements of his two biggest hits. He had a really big year in 1929. I don't know why. He wrote Ain't Misbehavin' and Honeysuckle Rose and also recorded Handful of Keys. So I'll probably play all of those for you. Huh, that's an interesting question. Do you sing the lyrics in your head as you play? Sometimes I sort of do, or, or I sort of listen to uh, the famous recordings that I like of, of these songs that I know so well. Uh, I don't have a photographic memory and I don't have perfect pitch, but there are some records I love so much that I've listened to them so many times I can kind of play the records in my head. It's funny how that works. <laughs> And I can't sing, but yes, I, I do know the lyrics for a lot of these songs, um, even though I don't sing. Yeah, here we go. Uh, for now, we're just going to do two. Ain't Misbehavin' and Honeysuckle Rose. This version of Honeysuckle Rose is pretty much the one that I worked up for the Old Time Piano Championship over 10 years ago, and I'm still playing it that way. And uh, in the, in the, when I'm playing in the saloon here, I call it uh, Honeysuck My Nose. No, that's not what it is. <laughs> Thank you. 
And there's Honeysuckle Rose. Thank you very much, everybody. Yeah, I uh, was inspired to create that arrangement of Honeysuckle Rose after hearing Frederick Hodges play a, a completely improvised version one day at the West Coast Ragtime Festival a number of years ago. That's one of those songs that kind of, you know, everybody's played, and so you have to do something original with it. And I threw on the tag from Handful of Keys. And Nada, I don't know Errol's Bounce, but I may play uh, Misty, which was written by Errol Garner for you a little later in the program. Uh, often in these live or virtual concerts, I like to program them kind of like I do live concerts. And what I do is I go through the history of music uh, chronologically. You know, I start out with some, say, some early ragtime and then do blues and then get into jazz and swing of the 20s and 30s later on. And uh, I, you'll notice I put out two pieces of music here on the piano tonight. And there are a couple of Fats Waller songs that you don't hear very often. He was truly uh, a brilliant melodist. He could really write beautiful melodies. And, uh, of course, his piano virtuosity is well known, but I, I don't know if he's given enough credit as a pop songwriter. And I thought I'd make a little medley of these two songs. They're both from about the same time period, 1929. Uh, yeah, My Fate is in Your Hands from 1929 and Rolling Down the River, which is from 1930. And Gene Austin recorded both of these songs. Gene Austin, not to be confused with Gene Autry, Gene Austin is truly one of my all-time favorite vocalists, probably my t in my top two or three. Uh, you know, I could listen to him sing the rest of my life and be very happy. And, uh, but anyway, that's how I fell in love with these two Fats Waller compositions. And I thought I'd play them for you now. Just, uh, I might have to look at the music a little bit. I know them pretty well. So see if you like them as much as I do. My fate is in your hands and rolling down the river. We'll do both the verse and chorus for each of these. I think I'm one of the few people that plays the verses for Ain't Misbehavin' and Honeysuckle Rose, too. Music by Fats Waller, lyrics by Andy Rizoff. I, I don't know how to pronounce his last name. Rizoff, I think, is correct. Here we go.
I love those songs. Uh, of course, they're much better with the lyrics, especially if you're listening to Gene Austin sing them. Ah. Over the years, I've become a very fast page turner. <laughs> um. Hey, Karen. Yes, I am going to do some Duke Ellington for sure. I'm, I might... Uh, I might do that a little bit later. Just wait a couple more songs. I'm going to finish up the Fats Waller segment here by playing Handful of Keys, of course. And it's, it's, I've never found it to be as difficult of a piece as, as it sounds. It's, you know, it's mostly based on scales in the key of F. Uh, he recorded this in 1929, and it became one of the stride piano um, benchmarks, kind of like Carolina Shout. And... I learned it from an exact transcription of Fats Waller's 78 record, so I think I play it a little closer to the way the composer did it than, than other people. Uh, not that it's good or a bad thing one way or the other, but um, let's do Handful of Keys. Here we go, folks. <laughs> As Fats Waller would do, he'd sit down and roar at the piano. That's it, handful of keys. That's how the record ends. It's it's kind of uh, anticlimactic. Thank you very much for all the nice comments, everybody. Well, um, before I do the Duke Ellington that Karen asked me for, let's take a trip to a different part of the country. And I've mentioned this in some of the broadcasts that I've done that were more devoted to ragtime, but this is very true of the early jazz era, too. In those days, before the days of the Internet, before the days of high-speed anything, <laughs> each different part of the country had a different musical sound. It was geographical. And so, uh, you know, the type of jazz I've been playing came out of the East Coast in New York City. But now let's go down to New Orleans 
and I'll do a little bit of Jelly Roll Morton for you. I did quite a bit of the early Dixieland jazz earlier this year when I did a New Orleans themed broadcast, but uh, just, just for a contrast, let's do some Jelly Roll Morton, and I thought I might play his very first published composition, Going Back a Ways. We'll do the original Jelly Roll Blues, and then I'll tell you um, about one of Jelly Roll Morton's connections to the, to the swing era. Uh, but for now, here's what early jazz sounded like in New Orleans back in the, in the early teens. The original Jelly Roll Blues. Yes, someone's commenting about how tall I am. I'm long-bodied, so I have to sit fairly low on the piano bench. One of my best teachers taught me to do that anyway, and so uh, I'm, I'm only about six feet tall, but uh, I have to sit kind of kind of low on the piano bench. That's the Jelly Roll Blues. You know, you can hear a difference in sound. It's kind of hard to describe. I was thinking about it while I was playing that. You know, the, the voicings of harmonies are different. You don't have that far striding left hand that you do in the New York jazz and uh, je but Jelly Roll, Mo <laughs> Jell Jelly Roll Morton's music was still improvisatory you know so it has that element in common with jazz of other regions of course Jelly Roll claimed that he invented jazz himself I think he was uh, exaggerating a bit uh, although he certainly was important in that movement there's no doubt about it in fact, I'm going to play one of his early compositions for you, very much ragtime in nature, but 
it became one of his bigger hits. And I only learned this about three months ago, and I, I realized I haven't performed it very often yet, so I'm going to do it again. This is Jelly Roll Morton's King Porter Stomp, which he named for uh, a pianist that he knew, no, no one knows anything else about him, named Porter King. But he switched the name backwards, so it's the King Porter Stomp. And uh, this is important to discuss tonight as well, because uh, the uh, chorus of this piece was taken and used by Benny Goodman's orchestra. They recorded King Porter Stomp in 1935, and it's widely considered to be one of the first swing recordings. So uh, just as a way of moving through musical history here, let's do the King Porter Stomp. the King Porter Stomp, pretty much as Jelly Roll Morton played it on his vocal style piano roll in 1923. That's how I learned it. With some of these difficult jazz piano pieces like that, I find it easier to learn them off a player piano than to read all of the notations on, a, say, a 12 or 15 page piece of music. <laughs> Blake says, I want to hear this at the Strader someday. Well, I would love to have you visit. I am supposed to play this summer, even though they're still reduced at reduced capacity, you know. It's, it's one of the only places I really get to do what I love and, and play this kind of music for the general public on any sort of regular basis. Um, we're about halfway through the program, so... A uh, quick commercial, again, I'm doing these concerts for virtual tips, and if you can leave some, I sure appreciate it. And I'll keep doing these and, and do as many of the requests as I can. Sharon, you want the, the Johnny Green medley that I play. Yeah, Dwayne wants to hear that too, so I'll, I'll do that momentarily. Uh, first, let's do the Duke Ellington medley. I, uh, 
his, his music was certainly some of the top jazz of the 30s. And I was talking about how the swing era began there with King Porter Stomp. And so let's do a number of Duke Ellington's hits, most of which he composed himself, not all of them. First, first is Mood Indigo, which I think is my favorite. And then we'll do Don't Get Around Much Anymore and a beautiful one called uh, In My Solitude. And then wind up with uh, the great uh, jazz hit Take the A Train which I understand it was named for the, the subway that went to Carnegie Hall. Uh, that's what I've heard. If anyone knows better, please correct me. So uh, here is my medley of Duke Ellington's music. I do a lot of medleys, just string one song together after, after another. And of course, that comes from working for almost 15 years in a bar and a restaurant. That's kind of how you have to play the piano. So people don't have to clap every two minutes, but <laughs> it's... it's uh, I enjoy playing that way. It doesn't hurt, you know. It's kind of like how I do themed broadcasts. I do themed medleys of songs. So here, here's the Duke Ellington medley. The Duke.
everybody. Th those are my Duke Ellington songs. I, I think those are all the ones that I know. He certainly was a fabulous composer and, and pianist, uh, heavily influenced by Willie the Lion Smith, I think. I can hear a bit of the lion style in his compositions. That said, I think Duke Ellington was probably the better pianist of the two. Just, just my two cents, it's not worth anything. Um, <laughs> Thank you all so much for the nice comments, everybody. I've had two requests now to do a medley of songs by the great 1930s band leader Johnny Green. So let me try and do that. My arrangement of this is loosely based on uh, that of the late pianist John Arpin, who was a good friend of mine and an incredible inspiration. And I didn't know who Johnny Green was until I heard him play these songs, but he wrote some songs that are very much considered jazz standards. Body and Soul, which is the first one I'll do, and then we'll do Coquette, uh, which um, John called Chicken Croquettes, <laughs> and, uh, and then a song that was uh, a ballad sung in the early 30s by people like Bing Crosby, a beautiful ballad called Out of Nowhere, or You Came to Me from Out of Nowhere. And I'll, I'll play that both as a ballad and then up-tempo stride piano, which is how John did it. So. Uh, here's a little tribute to the music of Johnny Green. Haven't played these in a while. We'll see how it goes. <laughs>
Hey, thank you very much, everybody. Duane, I'm so glad you suggested that tonight, and uh, Sharon, too. I haven't played those songs in a while. They're really wonderful songs. Johnny Green uh, started, I think he went to one of the Ivy League universities. I forget which one. And that's when he wrote his first hit, which was Coquette. And then uh, he led his own band and, and wrote many great songs in the 1930s. And by the 1950s, he was one of the music directors at MGM Studios and worked on music for many, many famous musical films, movies. If you look up his name, you can see all of them. And uh, I have a couple of friends that knew him personally, including uh, the great pianist Peter Minton. And um, I think my friend Richard Glazier met him, too. He lived in Hollywood later on in life. And uh, so that's a little bit about Johnny Green. Well, now that we're kind of going up through music history, uh, let's talk about the big band era a little bit. You know, I mentioned that the term swing came in around 1935. And to me, the epitome of big band music, of course, is Glenn Miller. And uh, there, there really was no band or orchestra that sounded quite like his. And speaking of Peter Minton, I was inspired to learn this song after I heard one of Peter's recordings of it. I, I didn't think of it as a good piece for a solo pianist, but it's really quite beautiful. And so here we're going to do uh, Glenn Miller's theme song, which he composed himself. It's called Moonlight Serenade.
Light Serenade by Glenn Miller. Thank you very much, everybody. Uh, go ahead and send in some requests. I've only got about two or three things uh, planned, uh, two or three more that I wanted to play. So let me check the, the YouTube website, too, while I'm at it. I got an interesting request on YouTube. It was a while back in the program, so I don't know if um, <laughs> the fellow who requested it will get to hear me play it, but I'm going to give it a shot because uh, it's an interesting piece by James P. Johnson. I was talking about him a lot earlier, and I'm one of the only people that plays this, I think. It's a number that he wrote that was only ever released on a player piano roll. So we're going to do Harlem Chocolate Babies on Parade. <laughs> and. Uh, the, the beginning of the piece quotes, uh, uh, I think it's the Chopin uh, military polonaise, but uh, any, anyhow, uh, here's this piece by James P. Johnson, Harlem Chocolate Babies on Parade. <laughs> Chocolate Babies on Parade by James P. Johnson. That piano roll has one of those wonderful uh, off-key 1920s endings, uh, tags on the roll. Uh, anyhow, I saw a couple of requests for In the Mood. <laughs> I, 
I was kind of thinking about playing that anyway, uh, you know, just to represent uh, more of the swing era. And so, <laughs> um, let's do my arrangement of, of In the Mood. It was Glenn Miller's biggest hit, recorded in 1938, I believe, unless you count maybe Chattanooga Choo Choo. And in fact, it was one of Johnny Maddox's biggest hits, too. He had a million selling piano record of this, backed up by a big band in about 1952. And uh, that was the first 78 RPM record that I ever remember playing when I was 12 or 13 years old. It was Johnny's record of In the Mood. So let me play that for you. I always think it's good to play a, a well-known or famous piece after one like that that's not so familiar. In the Mood. <laughs> to add a little extra boogie woogie at the, at the end of that one. And uh, Julia asks if I have a dominant hand. Well, I'm very right-handed, if that's what you mean. I can't even write A-D-A-M with my left hand. Forget it. <laughs> In the mood, it's not the greatest piece for a solo piano player. Pieces like that that only have three chords. It, it amazes me how uh, sometimes pieces of music with only three chords in them impress audiences so much more than uh, pieces that are actually much more complex or, or difficult to play. Uh, that's, that's in no way a slight on my audience, it's just a, an interesting observation. Hey, Barbara, I, I noticed that you asked me to play Flight of the Bumblebee earlier. Uh, what I play is actually Bumble Boogie. It's a boogie woogie version. And what I'm planning to do for my virtual concert next week is a night of blues and boogie. So if you don't mind, what I'm going to do is I'm going to uh, save that Bumble Boogie for next week's broadcast, but I'll definitely plan on doing it. I haven't actually played it that many times since I, I first learned it. Well, oh, there's, there's another piece of music out here on the piano that I thought I'd play for you. I actually picked this one up at the local antique store a while back uh, because I get a lot of requests for this. And um, the music was written by one of the most famous and wonderful black jazz pianists, Errol Garner, 
Uh, I've been to his gravesite in Pittsburgh, believe it or not. My friend Brian Wright took me to his gravesite. According to this uh, sheet music, he wrote this in 1954. It's very much a jazz standard. The lyrics were uh, written by Johnny Burke, and it's called Misty. And I have been playing this when I work at the uh, saloon here in Durango, and I do it as a medley with another very famous song from the 50s, which was a hit for the Kingston Trio. It's called Scotch and Soda. And they're both uh, sort of, um, that cl of in the classic jazz vein, so to speak. They're, they're of that uh, style and that period, so I like to play them together. And um, I hope you, hope you enjoy my arrangement of these. Here's Misty and Scotch and Soda. Now you can pretend you're in a smoky jazz bar in 1955. <laughs>
have scotch and soda. Thank you so much, everybody. Um, that's, uh, that's about as far as I go into real jazz. Uh, you know, that term encompasses so much. Uh, it could mean bebop, it could mean cool jazz, it can mean so many things. Uh, I play a lot of early jazz, which is still considered jazz. It's just very old. <laughs> and um, let's see, what I had something I was going to talk about. Oh, you know, and, and part of doing a jazz-themed broadcast is that I like to try and prove to people I can play more than ragtime. I don't want to dwell on it, but um, I do feel like I was sort of pigeonholed when my career first got started uh, because I was playing a lot of ragtime piano festivals, which I probably still love the most. And I enjoy those so much, but um, it's been hard for me to get bookings at, say, the major jazz festivals. I don't know. I don't know why exactly. Maybe it's because I'm a solo pianist and I don't play with a band very often. I don't know, but if any of you have uh, suggestions, you know, I am going to have to look for engagements when this COVID business is over. And uh, so I, you know, these live broadcasts have really been a wonderful way to expand my career because it, it was a bit of a struggle, you know, even before COVID. And so if you have ideas or any connections to um, theaters or music festivals and things like that, please, uh, you know, shoot me an email. Let me know what your ideas are. I'm going to start mentioning that more often because my mother was saying to me the other day, you know, you need to start booking now for when this is over. And I think she's right. I don't want to be left in the dust. <laughs> so if any of you out there are, are uh, musicals, uh, what's the word? Musical agents or something? Let me know. Mitch says, do you play weddings? Uh, I've only ever played one, I think, which was a family wedding, but I, could, I can certainly do that. I've played every type of engagement you could possibly imagine since I first started playing when I was 10 years old. I suppose I was 11 when I played my first public engagements. I've been playing in bars since I was 11. Uh, concert halls, um, hotels, churches, weddings, funerals. I played on the back of a flatbed pickup truck in a parade once. I've played um, outdoors, indoors, Carnegie Hall in foreign countries, home concerts. You wouldn't, you wouldn't believe all the stuff I've done. Mm, Scott, I'm afraid I don't know any Fletcher Henderson by heart, at least that I can think of. Uh, he's truly one of the great band leaders. I love his recordings. Variety Stomp would be a fun one to learn, make a piano arrangement out of it. Uh, in the meantime, let me uh, go ahead and play my finale for the night. I was hoping my friends Marilyn and Bill were listening tonight. I, I haven't seen them commenting yet. I don't know if they are or not. This is one of their favorite songs. It's also a favorite of um, a couple that I know in Baltimore, Mike and Penny Schwarz. And uh, yeah, that's right, Dwayne. I played the Kennedy Center too. <laughs> It's funny, you know, a lot of those uh, uh, engagements don't necessarily cover all your expenses, which is why doing these virtual things is almost better in a way. Uh, anyhow, uh, here is a really hot jazz and boogie-woogie piano arrangement of a Latin number called Taboo. And I looked this up. This was written by a cousin of the famous Cuban concert pianist Ernesto Lacuona. Uh, I think her name is Marguerite Lacuona. And it's called Taboo. And uh, the arrangement, I have to give credit to my friend Bob Seeley. It was very, this is very much inspired by him. Uh, my saying is, I only steal from the best. <laughs> so here's Taboo, everybody.
There's Taboo. Thank you so much, everybody. Thanks for tuning in tonight. I think it's been a really fun, jazzy uh, concert tonight, and I hope you've had as much fun as I have. Maybe heard some uh, music that you really liked, maybe some you hadn't heard before. And uh, please leave a virtual tip if you can, and I'm going to keep doing these. I really appreciate it. I say that over and over. I don't know how, how else to word it. And I'm, I'm pretty sure what I'm going to do uh, for next weekend, I'm going to do another th themed concert, and next Sunday night is going to be a boogie and blues night. Early blues and authentic boogie-woogie piano. Uh, that's Sunday night at 6 o'clock Mountain Time, both on Facebook and YouTube again. So please tune in, and I, I hope uh, you all had a great night. So good night from uh, Durango. Talk to you all soon.